So you can have one of these screens. Yeah? What?
compared with so many other fields of research, is relatively new. But right now, we have almost half a century and uh, people are researchers working on these topics. Now, so our focus is digital images. So we, from now on, when I talk image, I mean digital image. I mean it is this script, right? And here we have a sample of a digital image. An image is built of um, elements because it's a two-dimensional uh, function, so and it's discrete, it means that it has lots of elements. A two-dimensional uh, um, function which has fixed number of rows and columns for a specific image, it's looked like a matrix. So I have a matrix um, because this matrix has lots of elements, so I have to define what are these elements. The fundamental element of this matrix, which is an image, is called a pixel. So an image is made of pixels. So we have lots of rows and lots of columns, and each element is called a, a pixel. And as you can see here, we have, for example, one pixel in here, we have one pixel in here, we have lots of pixels. Now, the size of this image is 2,724 by 2,336, uh, which means that we have in each row, how many pixels? Yeah, 2336, 2336 pixels in each row. And we have about uh, 2,800 2, columns, right? So how many pixels or how many elements do I have? I have to multiply this like about 3,000 by 2,000, like 6 million, uh, right? About 6 million pixels I have inside this image, okay? Now, we understand that the first one, is f of one and one. In other words, the first location, first row, first column. And the last, last one is f of whatever the, the location is. But we said that when we are talking about the two-dimensional uh, uh, function, we have three variables, x, y, and the value of f. Now, in this course, we are dealing with um, images, maybe which are grayscale. Later, we have one chapter about color images, but whatever I talk before that chapter, it means that it's a grayscale image. In the grayscale image, we have different way of representation. Again, we will talk about those way of representation. We have chapters about that one today. It's just a, a very quick introduction. And in all the images that uh, we talk, if I do not specify anything, the image is an 8-bit image, an 8-bit grayscale image. I use the word image, but you have to read it 8-bit grayscale image. What do I mean by 8-bit? It means any single value of f is represented by 8 bits. In other words, I have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 8, a location, and these eight locations are all on sign. What, what does it mean on sign? It's all positive. It cannot be negative. Positive and, and zero. Positive yes, positive and zero. and zero. So it cannot be negative. Or it's got non-negative numbers. So uh, can you tell me that what is the minimum number that I can be? Zero. Yes, zero. I have to give all these values zero. And what about the maximum value that I can be? I can put all ones, right? This is zero, and this is 255. How many numbers can I represent? 256. Yes, I can represent 256, which is 2 to the power 8. So when I say an 8-bit image, it means that I have 8 location and I can represent the value between 0 and 255. This means, when I look at this image, if I pick up any pixel values, any pixels, I see the values is between 0 to 255. For example, the first pixel has the value of 103. The last pixel has the value of 88. I can look at a portion of this image, and if I look at it, I will see that I have these values. So for a computer, image doesn't have any understanding, any meaning. It's a matrix of a number, and these numbers are unsigned in feature 8 
We are using AP, but you have to understand that right now that we are talking, people are talking about something which is called high dynamic range. Uh, we are talking about 10 bits, 12 bits, 16 bits. Uh, our, our monitor, this is an old one, but our monitors are all, do you know how many bits our monitor represents? 10 bits. Our monitors are, are 10 bits. Uh, um, I don't know how rich you are, if you have iPhone or not, but I mean, if you have iPhone, you know that you are taking the photos which are all HDR, high dynamic range. In other words, they have, let's say, 16 bits or 14 bits to, to represent. So we are talking about a huge number of bits. Now, huge varying number of bits, and now the devices that we have at home represent different number of bits. In the old time, the camera with your Nokia was uh, 8 bit, your, your um, CRT monitor was 8 bit. So everything was very cool in the sense that you were getting 8 bit and you were representing 8 bit. Now you are taking n bits and you are representing m bits. Uh, there is no constraint that which one is bigger. Yeah, but usually the number of bits that we are occurring is higher than the number of bits that we can display, but there is, they are not equal to each other. So we do something which is called tone, tone mapping. There are masters and PhD thesis work still ongoing work in order to do this type of mapping. Now, uh, so the reason that I'm talking about that one right now is that I want you to understand this is very basic thing that you learn. We talk about 8 bits, but nowadays the challenge is this HDR. People are talking about 12, 16 bits, okay? Uh, it's, it's a challenge because you are working everything on 16 bits, and then you want to look at it, you cannot look at it in 16 bits, because let's say your monitor only displays 10 bits. So you have to find a way which you can convert the 16 bits to 10 bits with a minimum loss, okay? So this is actually part of I was uh, a master piece. Okay, so we have an um, on-site 8-bit uh, grayscale image, and here we see a sample of this image, Obelix image, which is one of our, our uh, data images that we use in our homeworks, and we are seeing a few uh, parts, a few pixel values. Now, if you zoom a lot on your uh, image that you have, you can actually start to look at a pixel. A computer, when you look at it, it looks like a what S squared because after some time you cannot zoom anymore. In other words, everything is shown with these small S squares. Okay, so this is the fundamental notation. And the reason that we have this blocky effect, these S squares, is because we are doing something which is called which is called digitization. In other words, we have I have, I have this is a toy that I have in my office, so I took this photo. So this is another toy. In other words, if I, I look at it with microscope, I can zoom in and in and as far well as I can zoom, I can always see the continuity, right? But then I took the photo, after some point I start to see that it's not continuous, it's just jumping, right? And it means that the photo that I have taken is kind of an approximation of the real world. But how good this approximation is, because we are as a human, as the people who will interact with our monitor, our, our, our photo, we see that our eyes cannot detect, our eye cannot zoom that much. So we say that, ah, oh, this is very good, right? Now, digital image processing. Um, if you remember, yesterday, before you come, we defined the uh, digital image processing. And we said that digital image processing means processing of a digital image. And we gave a few examples that we said that in our daily life, actually, we are using digital image processing maybe without knowing it. Uh, we are living in the world of social media. And I gave this example that you take a photo with your friend, you put it on the Facebook, next week you have a fight in the bar with your friend, and you hate that friend and you want to uh, crop him in, in, in the photo that you have. And so what you do, you go to your Facebook, you have the ability of crop, and you crop the person out. So cropping is also a, a digital image processing because you do some process on your image. Of course, you can have a noisy image taken from, by, by Hubble satellites and then you remove the noises to process. So this is also digital image processing. I mean, some are very redundant process, some are very meaningful process, but they are still of course process. We said we are giving the grayscale images, but most of the images that we have are color images. 
So we have to convert the color images into gray, gray scale image. So converting from color to gray scale is also image processing. So this is one of the tasks. Um, another one is converting, uh, okay, we have this, an image like this, and we see that, oh, the image is not very good. I want to play with the contrast of the image. So you can play with the contrast of the, the image to see how we can handle it. In this course, we will talk about color images. I will tell you how to convert the color image to grayscale. We will talk a lot about uh, making the uh, contrast or uh, illumination of image change. We have an exam question about that one. We will look at the methods that uh, we can use in order to do it. We have also homework on that. So you, you see, it's a very uh, important operation. Another thing is that we, we, you can make the image blur, right? You can make the image blur. You take a selfie of yourself, but the background is not very nice, and, and you want this, that selfie to be, to be there, because it's very essential to show that you're wearing Barcelona, right? So what you do, you can blur your surrounding. Still, you can see that uh, this is Barcelona, uh, but uh, it's not very clear, so you don't show the faces of the other people uh, that are around it. Or uh, you, you have some, so this was some, some daily life examples. This example that I give you and some of you smiles are, are really people doing it. And really people doing it, it means that you have to develop it because there are lots of customers outside who are willing to pay you a penny to, to uh, get that one. And if you multiply one penny by seven billion, you will be a, a billionaire, right? So uh, that's how, how, photo, how Adobe Photoshop did it. Uh, so, but in a professional form, you have some noises on your image, and you need to kill those noise. And you know that the noise can be removed, let's say, by, by kind of a smoothing or averaging your, your image. So you will do the blurring. This is also a topic that we will talk about that one in this course, and you will see how we can, we can achieve this, this blurriness. Another one is the opposite of that. What is the opposite of blurring? Sharpening. Sharpening. Uh, in sharpening, uh, if you are using in Instagram, for instance, you can sharpen your image. In other words, you can make, make the image, the details to, to be uh, shown in, in much more uh, um, detail. So we can talk about how we can do the sharpening in this course. Agents, do you want to go and wash your, your, your face? Yeah. It seems you're, you're about to see. Uh, another thing is that. Um, um, Sometimes you want to recognize some objects. And in order to recognize the object, you do not need much information except to know what is the contour of that, the, uh, that object. So in order to find that contour, you can do, let's say, age detection. So you can get and uh, grab the ages of those uh, images. We will learn again in this course how we can detect the ages. You will have a homework on that one, and it is pretty uh, useful. Another thing is uh, a black and white image, a binary image. What we use in medical imaging, what we use in the real life, in the production line of the company, which is everything is very, very automated. You want to check it. The, the, the production line is producing the thing that you want because you can make a mask and you can check if the object is look like that or not. If you are expecting to make a circle and something comes as a square, it means it's faulty, right? So you can always easily check it by using this. If you talk with your, your uh, I, I don't know, older generation, uh, they can tell you that, ah, in my time, the TV was black and white. Have you heard this expression that the TV was black and white? It's, we understand that this is a very wrong terminology that they use. What they meant is that at their time, the TVs were grayscale. And please note, we do not use the word black and white for grayscale, because black and white is either black or white. It is binary. So I'm expecting you to not use the word black and white for a grayscale images. OK? Uh, another thing is, Okay, we are dealing, we are in a world which color is playing a very important role and everything that we take is in color. So we need to, to process these color images in the, co in, in the color domain. So we will also learn in this course how we can handle the color images and how we can actually do some operation in the color images. We will also learn how we can do some operation on the binary images. 
So the reason that I have put all these singles ones as an example is because almost each chapter that we taught is talking about any of these operations. So by the end of this course, you will be able to handle the tasks regarding to each of these ones. When we are talking about them, I do give you professional examples like what we do in, in a medical imaging or, or in remote, remote sensing. However, we understand that uh, it can be also used in the daily life. Now, uh, one thing is about the uh, images, we have to look how the image is being formed. So the formation of the image is playing an important role. The S slides from now till I tell you have, we are, are mainly from, from physics perspective of an image. So they are not very of uh, importance from image processing point of view, so I just quickly go over them. Uh, we understand that uh, we have different frequencies and different wavelengths, and according to that one, we have different devices which can uh, detect these signals, right? And these electromagnetic waves that we have, only a very small portion of that one can be considered as a visible light. Let me turn on the lights. Many people are very sleepy, although I'm shutting almost in the class. Um, now, so a very small portion of that one is, is visible light. Visible light is the only thing that makes us to see. If um, we don't have the visible light, our eyes cannot see. But there are lots of other de devices which are working on different ranges and they can see things which we, uh, as a human we cannot see. Now, physicists have divided these ranges into gamma ray, X-ray, ultraviolet, the visible light, infrared, microwave, and radio waves. And now, in the next few slides, I will talk about each of these bands and we will talk about the devices which are being used, the images which have been taken in, that, in those ranges and the application. Again, you are not responsible for any of these slides that I show you afterwards. So, uh, the first one that we want to talk is uh, gamma ray. And now, one thing about gamma ray is that, uh, as you can see, the wavelength is very small. The wavelength is very small uh, and the frequency is very high. So, if the frequency is very high, what does it mean? And, and the energy is very high. It means that they are killing rays. So if, if someone exposes you with gamma ray for a few seconds, that's enough to, to turn you into dust. Right? So as the energy is very high, the frequency is very high, the energy is very high, and it, it's very dangerous. Uh, that's why that if you go uh, for, for taking some medical images by using these ones, they use it for a couple of uh, microseconds. Because if they expose you more, they will cause some harms. But as you notice, when we start to come down towards right, we lose the frequencies so of the signals. We uh, they, uh, will not be very, uh, will not have high energy. In other words, they won't kill you. Uh, as for instance, radio frequency or microwave, they they hardly kill us, right? Now the first one was the gamma ray, and gamma ray is is used in astronomy and used in, in medical purposes. Here you can see a few uh, images. I, I, I'm scared of turning off the light because there are three people who are already about to sleep. I switch it off to show you something and then I switch it off. This is an image uh, which has been taken from our body by using the gamma ray. And this is an image which has been taken from, from galaxy by using gamma ray. Uh, after I talk about all of the wavelengths, I will show you an image which has been taken by NASA of the same scene by different devices. So you can see that how they are, they are different. Now, X-ray, I think, is one of the most famous uh, um, signals which most of us are familiar with that one. Uh, especially if you have been a naughty child and you have broken your legs or your arms, definitely you have had this, this uh, X-ray. Is there anyone who has broken any bones? Yeah, good. So you, you are very familiar with this one. Uh, so if, if you break something, the best thing is that they do the, the X-ray and it, it takes like, they, they expose you for a second in order to find out what is uh, faulty. But not only in the medicines, actually, in electronics, they, they also use uh, X-ray. They already use X-rays in order to find out if you have a faulty part in the, in the motherboard of, uh, let's say, a computer or on a, on, a, on a circuit, because they can easily see 
if there is a disjoint in between some of the PCBs that they have produced. And definitely we can use it in the you know, astronomy. Now, another one is ultraviolet, UV. Now, UV can be also used for uh, medical purposes. I don't know how what the doctors can see, but there are devices which are being used in order to grab some pictures of some cells. And visible light is what the whole of this course is based on. This is that a small range which let us to see. And we have, as you see, all the images in different color channels, in color black and white, whatever is uh, shown uh, by using this uh, range. The projector is showing you this uh, slides because of this range. Now, the next one is infrared. But I talked about infrared, then I will go back in the previous slide because I need to tell you something else. In infrared, the most used um, application of that one is detecting uh, 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 live beings. In the sense that, uh, you know that uh, IR is very sensitive, IR uh, sensors are very sensitive regarding to the heat. So they can understand what is the temperature. So we can use it in order to detect whether there is a human somewhere or not to detect whether there is a, a live human that is still inside a, a, a construction which has to collapse or, or, or not. Uh, definitely we can use it in the um, astronomy. Now, our eyes, we cannot detect the, the IR. In other words, you cannot understand, by looking at me, you cannot understand which part of my body is, is hotter from, from temperature point of view. Uh, however, when we are building a camera, uh, we are talking about materials, and we cannot tell the materials, do not work after this point. So we cannot tell them that, look, uh, you're supposed to only work for, for this small uh, range, and then the frequency is less, um, let's say the wavelength is more than uh, 720 nanometer, uh, don't work. So what happens is that, I guess, these cameras, they are uh, very, they are working for something which is called near IR range. That's why that if you have your camera on and if you take your remote control which use the IR and you press the button, you can see that it is blinking. So your camera can, your sensors can detect it, but our eyes cannot see. Because all the cameras that we have, uh, I mean, okay, the new ones are, 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 are they try to, to limit it, but all, most of the cameras that we have are working on something which is called near IR. IR is used in order to calculation of uh, to, do, to do the calculation of the depth. Kinect camera is working uh, on that, uh, in, and in X2, we can estimate the depth by using the IR. Okay, the next one is microwave. Um, most of you, or not most, all of you are students, and I think most of you are living in dormitory. So microwave is like a kind of a very close friend because we heat up the foods. Uh, quite uh, frequently, and we have it in our kitchen uh, in, in, in the faculty, and we use it quite uh, frequently in order to, to heat up uh, our our meat. But it can be used in order to make something which is called synthesized uh, aperture radar imaging. In other words, they, they connect. There is a device which is sending this microwave. They connect it to UAVs or airplanes, and they, they flew over a land. And it sends a signal and it receives the signals back. And then, according to that one, it makes maps. It makes maps of the mountains, the valleys, uh, and they can use it for, for uh, geography or, or whatever is their purpose. And radio frequency, again, it will be widely used in uh, what's called uh, medical imaging, like in MRI. Uh, I don't know if you have taken any MRI. But if they want to look at your, your brains or the activity of your brains and check whether you have an Alzheimer or potential of an Alzheimer or not, they usually do the MRI imaging and it is using these radio waves. So we have talked about all these uh, electromagnetic waves. Here is an image, as I said, from uh, NASA, which you can see that one scene has been taken by using the devices with different uh, um, frequencies. So this is with, with gamma, this is with x-ray, this is with optical. Optical means that the uh, um, uh, visible light, uh, infrared, and with the radio ones. So they have taken images of the same scene. Of course, for us, which we are not expert in, in astrology, we don't understand things. 
But what, what happens as an expert, as an image person saying, I can, I can enhance this image, or I can make a device which can grab or, or, or make the, this image. But there are some people who work in physics or astrology, and they look at them and they understand that, oh, there is, a, let's say, a star giving a burst, or there is a black hole which is following, I don't know, a galaxy or whatever. So this is very uh, important for them, and this is very important for us to provide those information uh, uh, to them. But we will talk about the um, uh, electromagnetic waves in order to make the image. But we understand that electromagnetic waves are not the only resources that we can use in order to make the image. Another way of making an image is uh, ultrasounds. And I am so sure that you are all familiar with the ultrasonic devices, which uh, females use it if when they are pregnant in order to have the image of the, the baby. And it doesn't use the electromagnetic wave because it can harm the, the baby. What it does is they use sounds. And they send the sounds and they get the sounds back and based on the magnitude or, or the amount that they get back, they make an image like this. This is actually a, a very interesting topic in the sense that people do use ultrasounds on their kidney in order to find out whether they have a stone in the kidney or not. So in the medical imaging, they use these ultrasound images and they try to do uh, segmentation. It's a very challenging task because as you can see, there are lots of noise. For a human, it's easy to draw a contour and to say that, okay, this is the head and I don't know if this is the leg or whatever part of the body it is. But when you want to make it automatic, um, it, it's not very easy because there are lots of noise which can be categorized as part of the body or as a part of the object that we are looking for. In case of baby, if you are adding a little bit of noise, uh, we understand that the baby is not a unicorn, so it's a noise, and you can ignore it. But in case of, let's say, kidney, when you want to see whether you have a stone or not, if you take three noise in, you can say that there is a stone. Or if you remove three, uh, something as a noise, which was a stone, then the person has a stone and you cannot uh, detect it. So you understand that um, it's very important and very uh, challenging. Okay. Now, in general, when we are talking about um, uh, digital image processing, we have a very long cycle to go. Now, inside this long cycle, we start with the image acquisition. We are grabbing the image, we are getting the image. We don't talk about this one at all in this course. This is what the previous slide were about, physics, uh, and, and people who are working with, I don't know, uh, 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 photophysics or whatever the terminology is, dealing with that one in order to build the camera or devices which can get them record signal. Then we have image enhancement. Now, the image has been taken, but maybe the lightning is not good. Maybe it's very noisy. Maybe it has some other problems. So we have to try to uh, enhance that one. We do the image restoration. We do the morphological processing. In other words, if it is binary, we do that one. We do the segmentation, object uh, recognition, and the presentation and uh, description. In this course, digital image processing, we will talk about image enhancement, image restoration, and morphological operation. So we talk about these three topics. But while we are talking about that one, we will also talk about color image processing because we can have color image processing, color images here to enhance, color images here to restore, and the other one. And when we are doing these ones, we, we, at some points we need to transfer, transmit this data, these images. And usually the images are very huge. So in order to transmit them or in order to save as much as it is possible on the limited memory state that you have, we need to compress them. So data compression is really important. So in this course, we'll be talking about image enhancement, image restoration, morphological operation, color image processing, image compression. If we have a little bit of time, we'll talk about the segmentation. But if not, uh, we don't. Usually object recognition and representation and description is, are, are not within the image processing because what happens is that you will start to introduce some meanings and tagging those images. So it goes to computer vision and pattern recognition courses. So we said that in the image acquisition, what we do is uh, we have um, a scene, and this scene 
need to go to a digital form. So what it, how it happens is we, have, we are using something which is called a digital camera. And how the digital camera works, we have a scene, and we have a lens which gather all the, uh, the signals which are coming from you in order to focus it on, on some specific point. And that specific point is a place that we are putting something which is called the image sensor. The imaging sensor is some material which is very sensitive to different amount of light and frequency and it gives you different voltages. So the output of that one is different voltages. So this imaging system sensor, this imaging sensor can, can have a, a forms, a different forms, which we will talk about them in, in three or four uh, slides later. In image enhancement, as I said, we can have an image which is, uh, let's say, very low contrast, and we, we don't like it because we cannot see much of the tail. So we want to make it, let's say, higher contrast, or it's very dark, we want to make it brighter. In image illustration, as you can see, it can take an image from a space, let's say, and it send it to the uh, uh, base of the Earth, and we see that it's very noisy, and we want to get rid of those noises. Or morphological operation, morphological operation only happens on binary images. For instance, the very famous application is on fingerprint recognition. When we want to recognize a fingerprint, what is happening is there are lots of different types of joints on the fingerprint. And it's very important to detect those joints because they are, there's a unique signature of your body. In order to detect those ones, maybe when we are scanning it, we see that they are not very clear. They are not very clear. So we are applying different uh, morphological operations, which we will talk about them. This is an example from, from our uh, slides. We will get back to it. And we make it in a way that we can detect all the joints very clearly. Segmentation, as I said, in the uh, automatic uh, production line, usually what happens is that we have uh, a, a mask, or we have a sample in our hand, and we want to check always that what we are producing looks like this or not. So in order to do that, I have to segment out the product apparatus that I have from the background and from the environment around that. So segmentation plays a very important role. Now, object recognition, those of you who last semester took the pattern recognition, you already know what it is. We are here, what we try to do is that we have lots of data, we try to uh, cluster them into different uh, clusters or groups, or already we know the groups and something comes and we want to see that which group has to go. And then uh, descriptions and representation, which is again another hot topic in the field of image uh, processing and computer vision is this. Uh, Google is spending millions of euros on that one, and it is that. I'm taking a photo, and then the computer looks at the photos and says that, in this photo, there are human, chairs, and there's mobile phones and laptops, and then even it gives some description, like someone ha is holding the uh, papers and looking at them. Or there are three people or two people who have beer, and so they can, they can tag them. They, automatically, they can tag them. And this, these are very important. Why they are very important? Because the ultimate aim is to make a human, a robot which is look like human, and then they can kill all the humans, right? This is the, the whole ultimate thing. So in order to make that robot to come in the point and to say that, oh, we don't need human, let's kill them, it has to understand that in here there are humans, and these humans are listening to someone or reading something, and they are not attacking the, the, the robot. Do you understand? So it has to understand all these things. As a human, we are learning, we have a very complicated learning algorithm, we understand what is going on in here, and we can uh, start to tag things. But here, right now, information retrieval and these taggings and performances are quite low, especially on the real life uh, scenario. And as I said, it's a very complicated, very uh, hot topic, but you need to know lots of mathematics behind behind. Now, compression, I just mentioned that we need, we have big data, you have, you are all rich, you have your own Samsungs, your own things, some of you may have iPhones, and you have very like high quality images, couple of gigabytes sometimes. So you need to put them in, in, into your memories, or you need to email it to someone, and you want to compress it as much as it is possible. 
uh, or you, you have some medical images, they are very high, you need to compress it in a way that when you uncompress it, there is no loss. So the doctor can see that you don't have a ca cancer. Because if you lose some information, he can say that, oh, you have a cancer, but then you don't have a cancer. So a compression is important, and also the color image processing is also playing a very important role. This is an example for pseudo coloring. We will talk about it when time comes. Now, in general, we have three steps in the field of image processing and computer vision. We should start from a low level, and it goes to the high level. In the low level, le low level, the input is an image, the output is an image. This is something that we will do in this course, uh, like image processing. I give you an image, it's dark image. You do some operation, you make it a brighter image. I give you an image, it's a noisy image. You do some operation, you will get a denosed image. In other words, your input and output are of the same type. The second one, in the middle level, we give an image and we are receiving, we are giving some, some attributes back, like object recognition or segmentation. I, I give you an image, and you tell me that there are five faces inside this image. I give you an image, and you tell me that there are the eyes, the nose, and the mouth. So you give me some attributes back. And in the last one, I give you those attributes to a, to a system, and it helps me uh, the understanding from the system that it has. In other words, I give the attributes to the nose, to the mouth, to the face, and all to the chair, and I give this image, and it understands that, okay, from these attributes, then there should be some laptops here, there should be some chairs here, there should be some humans here. Now, I, I told you that we are using this image, image, uh, uh, imaging sensor. Let's see how the imaging sensor works. Because uh, we human, uh, in order to do something, we need to, to look at something in order to model it, right? We look at human and say, that let's make human eye. And uh, they look at human eyes and they then they say, that let's make a camera. So the camera, the basis of the camera is from the human eye. Uh, if, if you want to develop something very novel, uh, like, I don't know, some, some algorithm which works very well, some um, uh, mechanics which works very well. I do recommend you to, to always refer to the human and see how human is doing it. If you want to develop a learning algorithm, just think about it that how human learns that one. Actually, this is um, what I tell you is something like what in five years or in about seven years, people start to figure out, okay, this is actually a very good way. So they are going back and see how people are doing it and they try to, to do all those things. We are doing deep learning inside our, our brain, so they try to, to do the deep learning on, on a computer and so on. So they look at the eye, how eyes work, and they make it the, the camera. And the camera, as I said, has uh, something which is called an imaging sensor. And this imaging sensor uh, is sensitive to the light. So you give light, it gives you voltage. You give more light, it gives you more voltage. So what happens, we can, I can put series of these sensors, and I can look at the things either all in advance, or I can look at them line by line, or pixel by pixel, and I can see what is the amount of the voltage. Now, I give um, the value of the voltage, right? And like the value of the voltage of the, as an output is, let's say, 0 0.2 volt. I mean, these are an example. 0 0.2 volt or 0 0.21 volt. So I have some, some values. So what happens is that I define, if the value is between this and that, it means this quantization level. So I'm doing some quantization, then I'm assigning the uh, intensity value. So in general, we can have three ways of making the representation of this sensor. I can use it as a single sensor, which means that if I want to take a photo like this, there should be a sensor which goes from top to the bottom, and it has to walk around a lot. Or I can use as a line sensor, in a line sensor, definitely you are all used the photocopy machines or a scanners, and you know that that line sensor goes and it scans it line by line and come back. Or we can have something which is called an array of sensors. All the digital camera that we have, it has a CCD at the back, which is an array of the sensors. So when I open the shutter, I can grab all the scenes at once. Now, how sensitive this sensor is, it means that how good we can have the quantization there. If it is not very sensitive, in other words, imagine I, ha I, 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 I am a first year undergraduate material scientist which left the school and I don't have much knowledge, so the material that I can build will produce either 
voltage or no voltage. So if I use that one to take a photo, what type of photo do I have? A black and white or binary image, because if there is a light or if there is like too much light, I give one, otherwise I give zero. So it depends on how, what type of uh, materials I have or how sensitive they are, I can have, I can represent more number of uh, uh, representations. So this one can be changed to more number if I have much uh, finer materials. Now, here you can see some examples of these uh, the three types of uh, sensors, or the combination of sensors, single ones, or we can have a, a line one, like in the scanners, or we can have what we have in our, our camera. Now, when we have an image, so this is an analog image that we have, we are taking it through the camera, so what happens, each of the location will be assigned to a specific place. So as you notice, as you notice, there are some of the places which we cannot grab it, we will lose it. So we are picking up some specific value. Why we are picking up some specific value and we are not picking up, let's say, value that the laser points try to show? Why? Uh, maybe I can use a mouse. Why? I, I can have a value in here, I can have a value in here, but I cannot have a value in here. Let me draw it bigger. Why I can have a value in here? Why I can have a value in here, but why I cannot have a value in, in here? Because there's no sensor in there. Because we don't have a sensor in there, it means that not all the locations are uh, uh, possible to grab. Now, how many sensors do I have? We don't know, but we have a constant of one billion. So you have one billion, so you can count it, still you can count it. One zero, still you can count the number of sensors that you have. But the thing is, in the real life, we have infinity many. Because we cannot have infinity many sensors, simply I cannot put infinity many sensors inside the camera, so I have limited, which means that I cannot grab every single point. I have some of the points which will be missed. This is called sampling. So I am picking up some of these samples. Imagine I have a very bad setup, and I have only four sensors, four location, and I take a photo of this classroom, what happens when I look at the image, I definitely cannot see anything. I mean, it gives me, I don't know, four colors possibly because I have only four or four single locations. Now, so in the field of digital processing, it doesn't matter if it's an image or digital signal, there, is, there are two important steps which we have to uh, uh, follow and consider. One is sampling and the other one is quantization. Sampling means this, you said that an image is a function of uh, 2D, right? F of X and Y. Now, which x, which y, in other words, what are those coordinates? Something will tell us about that coordinates. And we said the third thing on an image is the value of f, like the value which is between 0 to 255, for instance, on the, in the AP. In other words, how many bits do I need to represent that one? It's called quantization. So the, la the level, the value of f is represented after that is by using the quantization, and the location is represented by sampling. So this is actually a slide which we start to talk and I'll assign a homework about that one maybe towards the end of the lecture. Now, imagine that we have this image which has been, which is analog. And I have a line sensor which is at line AB. Okay? And at line AB, my line sensor produces voltage values. And these are the values that the, it, it, it gives me. Right? Now, I know that I have limited number of sensors in my line. I don't know, 100, 20, 50, whatever it is. So I can only trust the values which are on the place that I have the sensors. So these are the location of the sensors. So these are the only places which I can trust the values. So it means that I have doing some sampling. Right? I am doing some sampling. And uh, what happens after that I'm doing the sampling is uh, what should be the value that I read? So the value that I read is this. If the voltage is 2 point, 0 0.2 and the voltage, another one, is 0 0.19, should they be distinctive values or should be the same values? 
this is something which you say that okay, I want, I want two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight bit. I'm sorry, eight, three bit representation. I want to have three bit representation. So it means that let's say 0 0.2 and 0 0.19 are one. So as you can see, what happens that these values that I read, I quantize them, I assign them to a specific finite values, finite discrete values. So this is called now quantization. So I do the sampling and I do the quantization. Here is an image which I am making it in a digital form after I do the sampling and quantization. If this is also a very important formula that we need to know. If I have n number of bits, so if we have n bits, we will have how many quantization level? If I have n bits, how many quantization level do I have? to the power n, in which minimum is 0, and maximum is, what's the maximum value? 2 to the power n, excellent, minus 1. Like, if it is 8 bit, we can have it with 0 to 255. Now, if I have, let's say, a 100 by 100 image, which are 8 bits, uh, how many bits do I need in order to represent an image? I have an image, it's 100 by 100. 100 by 100 by 8. Yeah, I have an image which is a 100 by 100, and each pixel has 8 bit representation. So how many bits do I need to have? 80,000. Exactly. 100 by 100 pixels I have, and each pixel is 8 bits, so I will have 80k bits are required in order to uh, save. Now, here is the sample image. This is a, a, a real image if you go to MATLAB and you create an image like this. These are the values that you see. Zero represents black. And 255 is representing white. This color of the black and white, this representation of black and white is very important. We refer to that one quite a lot. And typically, I have one question about that, which you have to be able to, to interpret and understand. What is color zero? Uh, color black. What is black? No. 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 What is black? No. No. What, what does it mean? No light. The absence of light. No. It means all the light is absorbed. There is no light which is reflected. Anything. You know that I, I, we can see each other because of the reflection of the light. If the light is not reflected, we cannot see. That's why we see it in black, because it's all absorbed. So black thing means it absorbs all. And white means it reflects all. It doesn't absorb anything. That's why we see it uh, white. But what do we mean it absorbs? What does it absorb? It absorbs some, some of the frequencies and reflects some others. So in case of white, it's reflecting all the frequency of the visible light. So we can see uh, uh, the things in, in white. Now, so remember, zero. Zero is black, two to the power n minus one is white. In case of 8 bit, zero is black, 255 is white. Now, here, um, it's not a very important table at the moment, but when we are talking about compression, we show this table again. It's telling you that if you are increasing the size of the image, how the number of bits are being increased. Um, I think nowadays, uh, even when you take a photo with your mobile phone and you look at the size, when it is 13 mega uh, uh, byte, you understand that it's, it's pretty, pretty heavy. Now, 
We want to talk about sampling and quantization a bit more. I have taken a photo of uh, my obelisk toy, and the size was 1024 by 1024. Okay? So this was 1024 by 1024. Uh, I will switch up the light again, but please do not escape. And when you have the potential. Uh, 1024 by 1024, right? And then I see that it's too big. I will make it smaller. I, I resize it. I go to Photoshop and I, I choose, let's say, resize, and I resize it to 512 by 512. Or I go to MATLAB and I make it smaller, 256 by 256, and so on to 32 by 32. Now, when I am reducing the size, do you know what do I do? I am telling uh, my algorithm that go to this image and remove some of the pixels, some of those X and Y's that we had before. Now, what is dealing with an X and Y? Which terminology was dealing with an X and Y? Sampling. Sampling is talking about X and Y. So when I am resizing, it means that I'm actually changing the sampling. Now, when we are changing the sampling, we are actually changing something which is called a spatial resolution. You know, have you heard of super resolution? Have you heard of the term super resolution? Or uh, let's put this one. Have you heard this one? Oh, this is a very high resolution image. Oh, this is a very bad resolution image. Have you heard things like that? Good. Um, or, or, um, in image processing, there is a technique which is called super resolution, and it's like that you have a very bad resolution, you try to enhance that bad resolution to a better resolution. Now, this resolution that we are talking all are uh, actually called a spatial resolution. It means that we are handling, we are dealing the sampling. We are increasing this X and Y's, or we are reducing this X and Y's. Now, when we have an image like this, our brain automatically look at the image based on the size. In other words, as we are reducing the size and we put the images, same image, with different size, uh, side by side, our eye, our brain cannot understand which one has a better resolution because we look at this one from 256 by 256 point of view. Whereas if I put them side by side with the same window size, we can see that as I am increasing the size, what happens, I start to lose the sharpness of the image. And actually in 32 by 32, I hardly can see anything. As I am reducing the resolution, as I am reducing the spatial resolution, or as I am done sampling, what I am causing is called uh, a, a, a blocking effect. I am causing some blocking effect. You can start to see lots of blocks and, and boxes in here, right? So this is the effect which is called by a spatial resolution. So when we are changing something on the uh, uh, X and Y on the sampling, it means that we are handling which is something which is called the uh, the spatial resolution. We can do the same thing in the quantization level. In other words, I can represent an image with 8 bit, I can represent the same image with 7 bit, with 4 bit, with 2 bit, so I can change the number of bits of the same scene. And if I do it, it means I'm changing something which is called gray level uh, resolution. So there are two re resolutions which you need to keep them in your mind. One of them is called spatial resolution. It's because of the sampling and samples. It's in some ways. One of them is called gray level resolution, which is because of the quantization. So it's the value of f, the number that you assign, this number of 0 to 2 to power n minus 1. If you change it, you are dealing, you are handling this gray level uh, resolution. Now, what is the problem with the gray level resolution is this. As we are reducing this number, as we are reducing this number from 8 bit to 7 bit, we are losing, we are killing the, la the least significant bit. So least significant bit has very small, small effect. 
But as we are starting to reduce the number more and more, do you know what can happen? We will start to introduce something which is called contour effect. We are introducing these contours. Can you see it in here? Or it's more visible to see it in here? Whereas we don't have it. We, we really don't have any contour. Just mm -hmm. illumination is changing and it's shadow. But we are starting to introduce this contour effect as we are reducing the gray level resolution. Till we get to the one bit, and when we are in the one bit, it is called a binary image, or black and white image. So, we start from an 8 bit, and if we reduce it, we get to a one bit representation. Now, as I said, in your homeworks and all those things, you can always use any computer language that you want, but uh, in class, I show you some MATLAB comments which we can uh, use it. I don't know if you're familiar with MATLAB or not. If you are, it should be a bit boring, but if not, it might be interesting. Uh, in MATLAB, uh, we have some very cool comments which we can use it in order to do image processing. Uh, the first one is that we can read an image by using imread. We can re resize the image by using imresize. We can show the image by using figure, subplot, and, 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 and uh, image show. Now, I showed you a few images, right, Aikun? I showed you an image of Obelix with different resolution, uh, different spatial resolution. And if you run this code, it will produce you that one. It produces you this image. This one, it produces. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six images, open six images with different sizes. Now, uh, because the image is a color image, I converted it to the gray scale by using RGB to gray comment. Now, if you want to have all the different spatial resolution in one figure, so you can see this blocking effect and how it is uh, affecting on, on the, uh, from visual point of view, you can use, you can run this one. By using subplot, you can have all in one figure. And if you want to see how the gray level resolution is working, uh, you can use the gray to int comment in order to change the number of bit, which is used in order to represent the image. And this is the comment that you can use in order to show it. Now, what we looked, uh, we talked about what is a digital image, digital image processing, a history of that one. We have seen some key stages, and uh, we start to talk about what is uh, sampling and quantization. So this is a start to keep working on uh, something which is called interpolation. Because what happens, sometimes you have this small size image, and you want to make it bigger. So we will talk about how we can make it bigger by using uh, techniques in interpolation. So on the next lecture, we will talk about this interpolation, and then I will assign you the first homework by the end of the next lecture, which is on next week. Do you have any question? I mean, if you have no question, I can see that Fatima is in hurry. We can have a, a nice time and in the class now. Thank you. We can stop the video. Ah, I'm recording the lecture, so I will also put it in, in YouTube.